The macro photographer can be found in all kinds of environments, but they're most comfortable in the rainforest. They can usually be found crouched down low in the undergrowth. Today we're in the Florentine Valley walking along Tim's track, where you can find all kinds of Tims, and today I found a Tim Grimsey. <laughs> Come take a seat. <laughs> Jesus. It's, it's designed so you can actually look up it really at the is. tree. That's amazing. Yeah. Tim Grimsey's night photography is sublime, but he's most well known for his macro photography. And what really excites me about Tim's photography is that you can feel everything that you're feeling when you're taking the photo. <laughs> the excitement. The excitement, the yes. Fairy tale joy. And it's it's that kind of excitement that makes me look forward to your next video and <laughs> and even just just the photos themselves. Oh, well thank you. Very yeah. kind. I, I look forward to the next video as well, because if I'm pressing record on a video, it means I've found something that's exciting. Which um in the forest is uh very easy to come by, I find. Well, today particularly has been amazing. We got out of the car and it was like 30 seconds. I was like, hey, over here, over yeah. here. Yep, and there was a good half an hour in there or longer, just on a few little subjects. Yep. Yeah. Very um, lucky conditions today. Yeah. Um, what's the longest time you've actually spent out without <laughs> finding anything worth doing? Oh, without finding anything? Yeah. Um, oh, maybe, maybe two hours. Yeah. Um, after after two hours, if I haven't found anything, I'm I'm um, worried. I'm yep. not. I, I I'm pretty disappointed as well. But I'm more worried because it just means that the forest is just really really dry. Or um, so yeah, worried about the conditions that you know if there's a spark, it's just going to all completely go up. Yes, of course. Um, but yeah, that's probably the longest that I've had not finding anything. Six hours is probably the longest that I've been actually finding really? and and immerse and like not realizing that six hours has actually gone past. Oh. Yeah. When you find some really nice fungi, yeah. Do you make an active decision on which one to do a video on, or, or are you looking for? Absolutely. Um, to make a video, I need something to say. Yes. Um, and. I need to, like, I kind of think, would someone else, if they were standing right next to me, would they be excited to see this? Would there be something interesting? Is there actually a moment of, um, I won't say education, because I do not actually know <laughs> anything about mushrooms um, or slime moulds or anything like that, but is, is there a, a moment to be fascinated by something? Not every single specimen has has that or is in a position that is easy to to get your your um, your phone in to record uh, yeah. and things like that finding something new that i haven't seen before or something that's like bigger than it ever before or like one log which has a whole heap of different things um on it that's really interesting to me yeah and hopefully to other people your followers obviously think so. Ah, followers. <laughs> what a term, what a term. I'm very, very yeah. lucky to have a, a, a very sizable community of, of people who are excited um, of fungi as, mm. as I am. Um, and they're the nicest mob, I'll tell you. Do you think it's because um, people don't generally look down and they, you know, some of those fungis are so small. So small. I think, yeah, the excitement, um, especially because like, fungi is, it can be quite regional. There's varieties that you can get all around um, the world, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some things that you can get here in Tasmania, but you can't get it in New Zealand or uh, that, that type of thing. Um, and so just to see something that you can't readily see in your own backyard um, is, is really cool. I love watching the accounts. Um, from like this one particular, uh, like Eric uh, Cho from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Amazing photographer. He does everything manually, which blows oh, really? my mind. Um, yeah, everything's just 
shoot budge, shoot budge, wow. shoot budge. Um, but immaculate photography, but the variety that he has um, within his shots is stuff that we just don't see here. Yeah. Um, and so it's really, really, um, really exciting to, to see what's on, on the other islands of the world. Yes. You're not a native Tasmanian. No, no, I'm not. I'm a liar. I actually come from regional South Australia um, along the Murray River. Right. So um, lots of like fruit growing oh, yeah. area, um, but a lot of like red clay dirt. Um, but I came to Tasmania um, on a holiday. We won a holiday. Really? For a family of four and we were a family of five. <laughs> And oh, I was the youngest, and they almost left me oh, behind yeah. with, uh, I guess, with, with my, my grandmother. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I think I probably cried and threw a tantrum, and so they, they paid for me to come. And I just remember being around, like, the Mount Roland area mm. in um, uh, Sheffield. And I think there's a photo of, of, of me just in this forest, just, like, mesmerised with it. And I always remembered just so much green i hadn't come across so much green before and mm. so when there was an opportunity to get a um a, a role a, a job in in tasmania um i absolutely jumped at it so how long have you been here so um far? around 20 years a bit oh, more right so a long time a long time you most of almost, my almost almost call yourself a local Almost, almost. <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll, I'll get a letter in the mail once that's once that's all sorted. I, I think so. But no, Tasmania is definitely home. And why wouldn't you want to call this place home? And just look at it. I know. I know. How far are you willing to travel for your photos? Is budget a consideration? <laughs> <laughs> in terms of time and everything like that. I drove for four and a half hours to get to Waratah in the mm. north of, of, of the state. But I was also then camping around um, Cradle Mountain afterwards. So right. I probably wouldn't drive four and a half hours each way just for fungi, um, up to two hours each yep. way maybe. But I'd have to know that there was something there. Like today, hour and a half mm -hmm. each way. But I knew that you'd have a good time if you, if you came to this forest. Yeah. And we have. Yeah, <laughs> we have. And obviously you can pretty much just step out your door and, and find something, you know, 20, <laughs> 30 minutes drive. Yeah. Um, you can from, from Hobart. Um, the, the place that I normally go, the Myrtle Forest in Collinsvale, mm -hmm. um, is not, it's not showing its colours just yet because it's been quite, quite dry. But otherwise, yeah, a 20 minute drive. Um, and a 10 minute walk from, from the car. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's so many different varieties. Um, big stuff, small stuff, colorful stuff, um, white stuff, um, as well as like just the beautiful streams and stuff like that yeah. coming down from Kanani is just lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're sport for choice here. We are. The northwest of the state, I'd say, is probably the most beautiful part of Tasmania. Just the access to the picturesque mountains up there is 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 pretty amazing whereas the picturesque mountains down here you oh, gotta work for you them. really do you gotta work <laughs> for them. yeah i know in my experience it's good six to eight hours of walking to get to and hard walking mm. yeah and then what's the light going to do that's yeah. right um that's why i love funky photography so much because you can control the light and the the conditions like it's raining a little bit today but like that doesn't stop us getting our gear out and, and shooting funky. That's, you can always put an, an umbrella or a raincoat over you. Um, whereas if we were chasing light after an eight hour hike, it could be, you know, yeah. quite disappointing and miserable. <laughs> That's okay. right. Uh, there is the obvious question that everybody gets asked. Yeah. What was it that got you into photography? Um, okay. I was bad at photography, yeah. um, like when, um, you know, your, your camera came into your phone and things like that. And I thought it was easy. You just point and shoot. Um, but my composition skills were atrocious. I, I knew nothing, but my wife had interest in it. Mm. And so we were going on, um, on a holiday and we wanted something better than our phone to, 
um, to take photos with. But in kind of like watching all of the, the YouTubes and everything like that, I thought, oh, maybe I can give it a go. And I went through that phase of, okay, if there's water, you've got to put on a 10 stop ND filter to make sure it's, <laughs> and shoot at F22 to make everything sharp and things. And it was still really bad. And then one night I went out, I was, I was about to go on the Three Capes track and for some reason I thought, okay, I want to take photos of stars while I'm on the Three Capes track. I don't know why. Um, but I headed down to South Arm um, with, with my wide, widest lens. Um, had no idea how to take photos of stars, like how to focus to infinity and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and went down onto the beach and there was this um, photographer, I can't remember her name and I owe so much to her, so it's awful that I forgot her name. Get in contact with us. <laughs> yes, yes, if you remember me. It was in April in 2017, I think. They taught me how to um, like focus to infinity um, by uh, magnifying the star and changing your focus until it's pin sharp. But there happened to be an aurora. I didn't even know that auroras existed in the Southern Hemisphere <laughs> at that time. So it really, really blew me away. And I um, developed an addiction to um, going out and trying to capture the, the mm. aurora. And through that, because you had such a, an amazing background, but to make it interesting, you needed to work on your composition. Mm -hmm. I really started to think about my composition ah. um, and it just improved, I guess, yeah. um, until, yeah, I got pretty happy and more confident with, um, with landscape um, photography. And so that's, I guess, how I got into photography. Also, dopamine is yes. a really, really <laughs> big motivator. So once you've taken a photo that if you know, a few hundred, a few thousand people seem to like. Um, it's a driving factor to do more, I'll be honest with you. You know, people are very nice with their compliments. Mm. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then you went from up there to, to down, down there. there. What, what happened there? And a friend of mine, um, Charles Chadwick, he had these photos of the pixie parasols, my center interrupter. And I was like, what the hell is that? And he explained it um, to me. And then I went out and I found some and I took a photo and it was really bad. Everything was like, you know, only a, a tiny bit of it was in focus. And I went mm -hmm. back to Charles and I was like, how come yours is so much better than this? And he explained focus stacking mm -hmm. um, to me. So I owe a lot to Charles as well. Um, and so once I knew about focus stacking and understood how to um, automate it, um, that, that was kind of like, you know, taking the, the leash off of a, uh, of a ra ravaging dog. I was like, <laughs> let me at it, let me at it. Um, yeah, so it was through seeing other people's um, photos and just becoming, um, fascinated with with mm. the like the, the color is so unusual in um, nature to to see, especially amongst the green of yeah, of the yeah. forest. Um, and yeah, I found that quite addictive mm. as well. And now I'm I'm an absolute pain to go for a walk <laughs> through the forest with because I'll just constantly oh pixies pixies oh can we stop pixies? So you're out there. You found pixies and all the rest, and you're yep. really, really excited by it. Mm. What made you then decide to put up videos about it? I like to wear ties, and I like to do different tie knots oh, as well. Just bang that. Yeah, little um, tie knots. Um, and for people in the tie um, appreciating community, the October, so for the month of October, trying to wear as many ties as, as possible. And I don't know whether it was boredom or I don't know, but I decided through the month of October one year to every day wear a different tie and do a different tie knot. And mm. I recorded it for my Instagram stories. And um, 
people just really enjoyed them. And the more that they enjoyed them, the more I enjoyed making them. And I think it was that which got me comfortable in just taking out um, my phone and recording myself talking to my phone and not feeling silly yeah. doing it. Mm -hmm. One day I turned the camera around on, on me and uploaded it to see how, how this goes. Um, and people wanted to be friends with me. It was, <laughs> it was nice. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know why, but then it's kind of like, okay, well, if, if people um, aren't going to like, turn, turn away if I'm speaking to them, well, you know, maybe we can be friends. Maybe we can, you know, share a journey um, through the, the forest together. Mm. So um, it definitely wasn't planned. Yeah. Um, and most of the time it was just like, you know, temporary stories. I can't really remember um, why I started doing them and leaning in other than it seemed to make some people happy and mm. I like to make people happy if I can. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about when we met, which was the Dark Mofo, Dark Mofo meet. Insta meet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did that come about for you? Chelsea had kind of seen that um, I'd been putting more effort into content creation, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, reached, reached out. To be honest, it was, I found it very difficult. Mm. Um, just because it, <laughs> I was very out of my depth. I was not in a forest. <laughs> there was lots of people around and I didn't really understand what I was seeing. But... <laughs> It was great to um, get together with a, a bunch of um, other photographers and yeah. and there should be more of that. I really should plan like a, an Instameet in, in the forest. Um, normally I like to go in by myself, but today's been so much fun. Yeah. Um, showing, you know, and especially because we've been taking um, shots of the same subject yes. sometimes. I'm going to be really interested to see the differences in how our eyes and how our equipment and um, yeah. yeah, processing uh, how it comes out in the end. That's right. I mean, the the red one, <laughs> the red one, <laughs> the red one. Um, so I I just went at a completely different angle to you. Mm. Um, but then the other ones, especially the um, the pixies that you did just over here, I just loaded my camera straight into your mount. Yeah. And all I've done is shifted the, the composition around slightly. So, yeah. It'd be... But with such a small world, budging something a centimetre can change the yeah. whole composition entirely. Yeah. So, it's, it's really um, interesting that, yeah, you can, you know, hey, there's my tripod. Use it. Plot the camera on and a small adjustment can completely change um, the different parts of the images that are uh, showing, whether the, the foot of a mushroom is, is mm. um, showing what's in the background. So you compare our two cameras and, yeah. you know, I mount that, my mount is like here, so it's already across. And yeah. So I don't get a choice but to adjust it. I can't just have your composition. Mm. Um, so it, it makes me think a little bit more. Yeah, the macro world is, is so amazing how um, just a tiny, tiny shift of a, a tripod, um, five centimetres, two centimetres mm. from one side or close back up down can change something so drastically compared to landscape photography where you'd need to move something like, you know, you could move something a metre. Yes. And it hasn't actually changed the aspect. That's right. And much. It's only those extreme foregrounds that people yeah. like to use where you still... It's a good 50 centimetres, mm. like, but I, I can't even adjust my camera that tiny amount, Yeah, um, which is where your rail is amazing. Yeah, yeah. focus rails. <laughs> oh. um, one thing that I can't see in my future, but I would love in my future, is a completely automated focus rail, mm. which um, has like a little computer attached to it. And you say, okay, how far will you move and how many shots, how... how um, Far will it move before every shot and have it um, like uh, automated with a uh, speed light and mm. everything like that? Because that's what you need for the like 
teeny, 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 right. tiny things. Um, even the small increments that we were turning that are uh, often too much. Too much. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right, I want to move on to your cameras. Okay. You've got a bunch of them now. <laughs> I do have a few few cameras. This one here is my most recent acquisition. And this is currently specifically for macro work. Okay. Um, and it's the OM-1, mm -hmm. not the Mark II, which recently um, came out, but the um, original one, but I've only just got it. Um, but this beauty here, a 90 mm um, uh, 3.5, uh, macro mm -hmm. on a micro four thirds sensor, but this shoots at um, two over one macro resolution. Mm -hmm. Most macro lenses are one to one. Yeah. This shoots um, at two to one on a micro four thirds sensor, so it's technically an equivalent of four to one on really? a um, a full frame, um, which is just absolutely. Um, Amazing, and it's all like um, uh, automatic. I've also got uh, an Nikon um, DSLR with a lovely Sigma macro lens, which has been doing me absolutely fine, and that's mm -hmm. got inbuilt focus stacking as, as well as this. Um, but what it doesn't have is automatic focus, stack, focus stacking, which also syncs with a, uh, a speed light. Especially with the small stuff, you'd think that it's um, would be only like a few shots to get everything in in focus because it's so small. But the sliver of the depth of field that you get when you're doing it ultra macro mm -hmm. is is just um, ridiculous. But I also got an adapter for my OM so that I can adapt my full frame lenses onto it. Mm -hmm. And I have a Lauer oh, Ultra Macro um, 25 mil, which goes up to five times macro. Ooh, wow. So that's up to 10 times oh, amazing. on, on that. Frame. And so the finding something which is like two, three millimeters tall, mm -hmm. and you're almost filling the sensor incredible with it and then i've also got like a little fujifilm x100 v which mm. um was to be my hiking camera yeah i don't know whether this uh. is going to replace that or not um but um i do love the simplicity of it mm. there is one bit of equipment though that yeah. i think um most macro photographers could benefit from that's a circular polarizer mm. filter on it the so so many times because you're in the forest it's moist um so much reflection from the the sun from the like the wood that the yeah, mushrooms okay. are, are on to get the richness of like the reds and the browns of the wood mm. just a little turn of the polarizer yeah, okay. and it really brings it out um and i can't see anybody else saying get a polarizer filter so get a polarizer <laughs> It, it just makes the colours pop so much. Yeah, yeah. So, so much. Okay. Who are you more or most inspired by? Oh, that's, that's hard. Because if I start a list, I'm going to either not stop or Within miss somebody, miss, miss somebody um, out. Um, uh, Jamie, whose Instagram account, um, This Forest Floor, um, okay. she's based in London. Um, and spends so much of her time in um, in the old forests around London, um, documenting what she finds. She's incredibly prolific, but her output, all of it, is is inspired. Maybe I'm um, missing something, but it appears that uh, she can go out for a day and come back with a hundred images, all of which are. Um, uh, pristine, incredibly well composed, incredibly well captured, but she's also one of the most generous people um, in the, the community that I've come across in terms of tips, in terms of encouragement, in terms of using her um, platform to promote macro photography. She has her own um, uh, ways of describing things, which is just fantastic. So I get a lot of inspiration from Jamie, and she she's genuinely having a great time 
Um, I will give a shout out though to to Ryan Shan mm -hmm. as well as a Tasmanian based fungi uh, photographer and astro photographer. My God, that's his his astro stuff's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, just because um, he needs to back himself more because he's a maestro. What is the biggest lesson that you learned? Probably the the, the biggest um, lesson in photography that I'd learned was if you're not enjoying it, go home. If it becomes uh, something that you're getting stressed about, um, which has happened with me before, um, it just takes away from the joy of it. And it should be a joyful thing unless you're making money out of it. And yes. I don't intend to make money out of it. I intend to continue getting joy mm -hmm. um, out of it. So yeah, if it's, if you find yourself muttering to yourself, I'm not having fun, it's time to pack up the camera, jump in the car and go home. If you're taking photos of fungi and you have the option to, focus stack. <laughs> focus stack, focus stack, focus stack. Um, and then learn how to post-process focus stacking yeah. um, to make it look like it hasn't been focus yeah. stacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is your best quick and dirty tip um, the best quick and dirty tip is, um, oh, I don't even know if it's a tip, but quite often I'll just plonk a tripod and shoot, um, without putting too much thought into composition to avoid overthinking, uh, okay. composition, um, doesn't always work, but it can can help you unlock something which you might not have actually thought of if you were considering it. Um, otherwise, circular polarizer. <laughs> circular polarizer. Thank you. Oh, no Thank worries. you very much for bringing me out here. It's been amazing. No problem. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Always uh, up for sharing this beautiful wilderness. Yeah. And I hope that um, my viewers will get something out of it as well. Cool. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>